In this video, we're talking about how to make sure your AI coded apps are actually secure. Because the last thing you want to happen is that you build up to launching something you're really proud of only to have your dreams shattered because you had a leaky bucket. Because the thing is, most AI coding relies on the model provider or the platform to do things the right way. But once you get in and start customizing things, it's really easy to inadvertently cut corners. Now, all you need to do is look at actual software companies that were entirely ruined because real human beings cut corners and created giant security holes. So in this video, we're gonna go through a tool I found that can scan your entire code base for vulnerabilities and give you recommendations for patching them. Then I'm gonna show you a prompt I created where you can give that report to your coding tool of choice and have it fix those issues for you. So let's get the ball rolling by first talking about a few fundamentals. So first things first, with all of these things, you need to know approximately what you should be looking for, especially if you are not an engineer by trade. So there's a few organizations that actually try to codify the gold standard of what it means to build something that's secure. One of which is called OWASP, and they have a top 10 tier list of things you need to make sure you are doing properly. Now I'm going to link this full list and a link to their website in the description below. And I'm just going to briefly touch on the top five that I see as most important, especially for vibe coders. After that, we're going to get into the tool that actually scans through these things and gives you recommendations based on what it finds. So the first category and the easiest to not completely mess up are your secrets and your environment configuration. So basically, if you push environment variables or even hard-coded values or credentials, you are setting yourself up for serious problems. And that's one of the things that this tool can scan for. Now, second up on the list is authorization. So a lot of beginners tend to only think about the authentication of their app. Is the process of actually logging in secure? But authorization covers custom code that you have written. And the thing is, AI systems can easily get it wrong because they don't know what your intent really is for that code. I'll give you an example. The social media platform Parler had its entire platform scraped because it didn't have authorization in place on its public APIs. So basically what this means is, sure, someone can log in, but what are we allowing them to actually access? If Joe Schmo is authenticated and logged in, can he just make blind requests to your API and create new users or set himself up on a plan where he doesn't have to actually pay you but still gets access to all the features? Again, authorization is really a huge piece of what you need to think through when you're creating endpoints in your application. Third on the list is kind of a combination of a few of these misconfiguring the security. So you might have a lot of this stuff locked down, but did you expose too much? One of the things LLMs love to do is to take shortcuts to solve problems. And sometimes that means setting configurations that allow too much access to bypass a small problem that should have actually been resolved at its root. A simple example of this would be setting your course headers to accept requests from anywhere. Or but maybe it's leaving the debug mode on accidentally when you push to production. Now, a lot of these things are obviously what professionally trained developers will look for and know not to do. But still, sometimes things can slip through the cracks. Fourth on the list is your dependency security. If you're one of those people that just NPM installs anything that the language model recommends to you, you might be inadvertently installing compromised code directly into your project. There's actually an example of this happening right now as I record this video with React, where it's created serious security vulnerabilities for anyone that uses certain packages. And I will actually link to a video around here if you want to learn more about that. And last but not least, number five, logging and monitoring. Now, this one isn't sexy, but it is critical. Say something really bad does actually happen. How do you know it happened? And how do you know how someone actually got access to do that thing? If you don't have logging and monitoring in place, you'll have no way of tracing back where that hole in your system actually is. You can't patch a hole you don't see. And so logging and monitoring gives you eyeballs. 
So again, full list is going to be below, but these are the top five that I tend to see, especially with Vibe coders that are not developers by trade. So you'd be an idiot not to test for these things if you have an actual project that you're really intending to deploy for other people to use. So all that aside, let's get into it now and start talking about the tool that we can use to solve these things. Now, the platform that we are using to do this is called SEMgrep, and it bills itself as an AI app security engineer. What that means is it uses a bunch of different rules to analyze your project. And the best part is that it is actually specifically engineered to look at that OWASP top 10 that I mentioned earlier. So that being said, let's check it out. So signing up is easy. You just click the try for free button and you sign up. Now on a basic level, they have two different options. Number one, they have the community option, which is open source and it is free. So you don't have to actually pay to use their basic functionality. But if you're going to actually deploy a real app, I think it's highly worth it to actually move on to their $40 per month plan, even if you're just going to use it temporarily. The reason I say that is there's actually three different primary plans that you can access. The first one is called SEMgrep Code. The second is called SEMgrep Supply Chain. And the third is SEMgrep Secrets. And they kind of do exactly what they sound like. Secrets is going to constantly analyze your project and make sure that you're not dumping secrets accidentally into your project. SEMgrep Supply Chain is going to look at all the different packages and dependencies that you have in your app and make sure that you're not making a serious error in using one of them. And SEMgrep Code is going to actually use its rule set to look at the code you've generated and make sure that, again, you haven't done something really dumb. So once inside, all you really need for this to work is a committed Git repository so that you can track all the different changes and the files that you have inside of your project. Now, the nice thing is you can run all of this locally as you're developing, and you can also connect it to your production environment so that when you push to GitHub, it automatically runs this check before it allows you to push this into your real production code. So I'm going to show you how to run it locally using this project that I made that is intentionally horrible from a security perspective. So we have hard-coded database credentials and a whole host of other stuff that we really should not be doing. So if we want to push these findings up to the actual SEMgrep platform, all we need to do is type in SEMgrep CI and hit enter. And so what this is going to do is it's going to take all of the rule sets that it has and all of that stuff and it is going to scan your entire code base against that rule set. And so we can see the products that are actually enabled on this scan is code and supply chain. So we're not actually looking at hard-coded secrets in this example. And we can see now it's looked at 26 different files and has cross-referenced them against almost 2,500 different code rules and 4,800 different supply chain rules. So now what's going to happen is this thing is going to scan, it's going to run, and it's going to push its findings up into the platform. And so now that we are back inside of the platform, we can look at our projects. And in this case, we're looking at this bad off project. And so it's broken down into code findings and then supply chain findings. So if we have issues in our like package files or the things that we're using in the project, it's going to highlight them there. And then the code findings are going to look at the actual code we have written and what the biggest issues are. And so what we can see is that we have a ton of unencrypted requests being sent over the network. And so it's going to categorize this into how big of an issue it is. In this case, it's saying medium, I think is probably a little bit higher. And then it's going to list out all of the different files that we have and what those issues with it actually are. And so this process, as you can see, it's incredibly valuable and it takes really next to no time for this thing to run. So skipping this is like knowing that someone is coming to kick you in the nads with a boot and you decide not to put on your steel reinforced protective garment. But now that we know that we have all of these issues, we can work on actually mitigating them because knowing you have these problems doesn't mean anything if you don't actually fix them. And so the way we're going to start this process is just by downloading the findings as a CSV file. Now, if we go back inside of our project, I've moved that CSV file into this root directory, and I also have a an agent definition, which you can also run, might make more sense actually to run as a custom command, which can basically take in these external findings, prioritize them, and then actually fix them. Now, you might also be able to just ask Claude Code or whatever your tool is to fix these things, but I like to run this process through because it's very structured. 
So all we need to do now is to go back into our Claude code instance in this case, but again, this will work for any tool. And if this was a slash command, I would just run the slash command. And then I'm going to give it a reference to this actual file that has the findings. And I'm going to tell it to basically run this thing. So this thing is doing exactly what we asked it to. It read our agent definition. It took this findings file into account, which had a list of all of those different issues. And it's now moving through reading the files with issues and resolving them. So I'm going to let this thing run through and then we will run that scan again to see if we solve those problems. So now that this thing is finished running through, we can hop back into our terminal. We can commit the changes and we can run this semgrep CI command again. So now this thing is going to run through and it's going to just reprocess everything that we have in our project and we'll be able to see the results in our dashboard. And so we can see now that this thing is done running that we have no more code findings. It fixed all of those issues. And then if we wanted to, we could move on to these supply chain problems using that same exact process. So I could download this out, I could send it in and I could have it resolve these issues too. So there you have it, security holes plugged up. Now, again, just to reiterate, I think if you're gonna use this in an actual product that you intend to push to real human beings and have them use, you should definitely upgrade to the $40 a month plan and make sure that we're being as robust as possible with making sure that these things are tightened up and that there aren't any serious problems. So there you have it. Pretty straightforward process to make sure you aren't going to get pwned all too easily. But just remember, if you're going to take the time to build something that you want to monetize, that you're taking the time to make sure that your customers and the product are actually safe and secure. And these tools and different tips that I've gone through are a great way of making sure you have that secure foundation. Now, it's worth noting they also do have an MCP server, so you can run this more directly inside of your actual development environment if you want to. But if you want to see a video where I go through my top five MCPs and show how to use this one specifically, I will link to that video at the end of this one. But that is it for this video. I will see you in the next one.